What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the uh, welcome to the show. This is Edward Williams, licensed physician assistant, founder and creator of Health by Any Means Necessary. And um, so, look, I know I said I was going to take a, a break, step away from this conversation about COVID, and um, quite simply. I got to the point where I just got tired of uh, stating the obvious, something that was obvious to me. And it was also obvious to a lot of other people at the time. And now it's starting to become obvious to more people. But I stepped away because it's one of those things where, all right, you get it. You see what's going on. Your video is getting banned. You're getting your account suspended. All right. Um, so you're going to move in a different direction, not so much a different direction, but you're going to move in a different way, still the same direction, but you're going to change up your strategy. And, uh, so I went back to, uh, dealing with the content that I was dealing with before while just keeping an eye out on things that were relevant that I would need to speak on as it pertains to this whole COVID pandemic vaccine talk. And uh, that's what I've been doing. I've been taking notes, been sitting back, collecting data, and just watching it, watching this whole entire thing unfold. And um, if you all remember, some of you remember, I released my first video about COVID February of 2020. And um, I explained why I was releasing it back then. I explained that, you know, we've seen something similar to this, uh, not so much the virus itself, but the impact that it would have on the psyches of society in general, people in general, the psyche of people in general. And um, also talked about how society was about to be abused, essentially is what I said. Um, And that's a lot of what you're seeing right now. So I'm going to get into this conversation. um, But before I get into it, I'm going to start the conversation off the same way I'm going to finish it. And that is, you can't trust the experts. You can no longer trust the experts. At one point, there might have been a time. At one point, I would say that there was a time. There was a time where you could trust the experts. There was a time where you could actually trust that your doctors, your your scientists, um, even some of your politicians, you know, there was a time where you could say that those who were in charge or those who were the experts or the voice or the leaders had society's betterment or progression in mind, in heart. I would have to tell you that as it pertains to the medical aspect, I mean, really, I'll say it on multiple aspects, especially the economy, um, but I'll just stick to the medical aspect. You can't trust many of these experts. For multiple reasons, but I can just narrow it down to two. Many of these experts are cowards, and many of these experts are whores, meaning that they will sell their opinions and sell their quote unquote research and sell their conclusions of their research to whatever it is you want them to come to come to as a conclusion. That way. It can now be established as a fact, even though it's all fake. If you have enough money, many of these so-called experts will give you whatever conclusion you want. It's a very unfortunate and sad (laughs) reality, but that is where we're at today. And I mean, you can see it. Many of you can see it right now. I don't have to even bring up specific Examples, many of you can see it right now going on before you. Things that we know, things that we know to be true or not true. And then and then roll the experts out and what are they saying? They're saying the very opposite of the things that you know are biologically not true. You know that this is all a fantasy, fairy tale. But the experts will come out and say whatever it is if the price is right. And so 
I started coming to this conclusion uh, right in the beginning of my career, uh, so around 2014. Um, I started coming to the conclusion right in the beginning of no, the end of 2014. So uh, right after I graduated and right after I started practicing um, over here in Florida, uh, I was trying to figure out <laughs> what was going on with this whole diabetes and high blood pressure thing. Why is it so uh, prevalent? Why is you know why do so many people have it? Uh, what is it? What's the cause of it? And me getting to the actual conclusion, the root cause, but also uh, coming up with a strategy to help get people off of their medications, uh, reverse their type 2 diabetes, get off the blood pressure medications, optimize their blood pressure uh, in a natural way, didn't take long at all. Once I came to that conclusion and once I came to the, the strategy and the protocols, I had to sit back and look at everything I was reading because there was a point where I honestly, I have to say that I went through a mild level of psychosis because I'm looking at the evidence, I'm listening to what they're saying, I'm listening to what they're pushing, and it doesn't match up. And right then and there was when I started to see that, all right, some of these folks are merely just selling out to the pharmaceutical companies. And I know that seems very, uh, like it's very cookie cutter, right? Like you hear that all the time, big pharma, big pharma, big pharma. In that situation, for sure, that's what I was seeing because take something like type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a very straightforward condition. It's not even a disease. And I'm going to get to the talk about the vaccine and this little Keebler elf leprechaun, Fauci, in a little bit. Um, but like I said back in 2020 of uh, February when I made that first video, if you don't understand the basics as far as high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes and why these things are not a disease and why the medications for those things are not going to save you the way you think they're going to save you, then what we're about to see unfold with this whole virus thing. And I said back then in 2020, February 2020, March 2020, if they roll out a treatment or a vaccine, be prepared to get hustled. The reason why I said that is because I see and I know how they work with chronic conditions or what they call chronic diseases. Uh, Type 2 diabetes sits on the foundation of insulin resistance. Prediabetes, PCOS, high blood pressure, obesity, all of these quote unquote diseases, their conditions, uh, they're, they're, they're a state of being. Uh, they're, they're conditions uh, that you exist in at that moment, but they're not an actual disease. But the reason those things sit on a platform or foundation of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance comes from your lifestyle. Uh, this lifestyle usually includes an abundance of processed foods, uh, lack of movement, an abundance of sugary drinks, um, and little to no vital nutrients such as vitamin D, zinc, calcium, all those things that are important. And you mix all of that in <clears throat> with the infusion of the processed foods multiple times a day, every single day, your body is going to get to a point where the cells are going to have to downregulate as far as their response to the insulin. And so you're going to have a backup of sugar in the bloodstream. The sugar is going to be redirected to the liver. The liver is going to do its best to convert that sugar into fat and ship it out to the fat cells. But if you're eating multiple times a day, some of that fat will now have to be stored in the liver while doing its best to ship it out to the fat cells. But also a lot of that fat is going to be stored into your other organs. Uh, one of those organs being your pancreas. And once you understand that fat itself is an organ, fat does not belong in organs. And anytime you have fat that is engulfed in organs, it slows down the function of that organ. And so if you are a liver and your job is to filter blood and your job is to release glucose uh, when blood sugars are decreasing, then whatever your job is, even if you're a pancreas and your job is to release insulin uh, when glucose is present, whatever your job is, you're going to have a decrease in your basic function functions. And over time, this decrease 
allows the blood sugar to continue to pile up, forces your pancreas to secrete more insulin, makes your, your liver store more fat and place more fat in other organs. And this becomes a cycle that you're doing over and over and over until your A1C rises and you're now diagnosed as being a type two diabetic. Um, but the problem is not the blood sugar. The problem is not even the insulin resistance itself. The problem is the lifestyle. And so if you reverse engineer that whole process, but in order for you to reverse engineer that whole entire process, you have to actually have the truth about why that process even exists. Uh, but if you reverse engineer that whole entire process, you're going to come out to the end that, oh, in many cases, we're actually eating our way to type two diabetes. We're actually eating our way uh, to high blood pressure. Uh, obesity, all, all these conditions. Uh, but type 2 diabetes itself is not an actual disease. Uh, type 2 diabetes itself is actually a sign of an unhealthy lifestyle. High blood pressure is actually a sign or a symptom of an unhealthy lifestyle, uh, high consumption of processed foods and little to no movement. That's what it is. And the reason why medications itself will never reverse these conditions or quote unquote, cure these conditions is because you can't take a lifestyle condition that was brought on by a lifestyle, throw medications on top of it with the hopes of reversing it or curing it. Why? Because one, it's not a medical disease. It's a lifestyle condition that was brought on by lifestyle. However, when you start taking on medications, uh, these medications, you got to understand, just like I tell you all about nutritional colonizers, where you eat food, processed food, in order for much of that processed food to be broken down and utilized by the body, it's going to have to, your body's going to have to utilize its own natural vitamins, and minerals, its own natural resources, its own vitamins and minerals. And as it's using its natural resources, the vitamins and minerals, to break down and digest and assimilate the food properly, your natural resources are diminishing. Like the, the resources that you have are decreasing. Those resources should be replenished with whole foods or by you bringing in more vitamins and minerals. However, if you're constantly eating processed foods day in and day out, you're not replenishing your natural reserves. You're not replenishing your natural resources. And so the reason why I call processed foods nutritional colonizers is because they come in to the to territory of your body. They rob you of your natural resources, would be, which would be the zinc, magnesium, the calcium, the vitamin D, all of these things that, that the body has to utilize to uh, break down these foods, but also to decrease the inflammation, the glucose, uh, that is being caused because of the metabolic habit. And so in two ways, the processed foods are affecting you negatively is by robbing or one, causing the inflammation, causing the high glucose and high blood, blood sugar spikes, the high insulin spikes. Uh, the high insulin is going to cause inflammation. Uh, the high glucose is abrasive to your arteries, to the linings of your, uh, your, your arteries, your blood vessels. Uh, and so it's going to cause metabolic havoc on one side, but in addition to that, it's also going to cause your body to use a lot of the resources that it has, the minerals and the vitamins. And so if you're not bringing those back things back in, over time, your body's not going to be able to heal and repair itself the way that it should if it had the resources that it had. Now, the way I call processed foods nutritional colonizers, many medications are also medication or medical colonizers because those medic medication because those medications come in and they rob the body of many of your vital nutrients as well metformin b12 folic acid b12 is one of the, the biggest things that uh when taken over time metformin will decrease and b12 is extremely important as it pertains to the health of the myelin sheath which is the coating around your nerves which when that coating around your nerve starts to deteriorate, uh, it can feel like pins, needles uh, in that body part. And many people will believe or be told that they have neuropathy when in fact they may just be B12 deficient. Um, 
medications like hydrochlorothiazide, uh, which is supposed to be a blood pressure medication, a diuretic, uh, decreases potassium, magnesium, and your sodium. Uh, and that's supposed to be a good thing because it's supposed to allow your body to release what they call extra fluid or excess fluid, which is all here again in general. Um, but anyways, it's along with you treating that quote unquote excess fluid, you're also losing magnesium, potassium. And these are very two important minerals to help uh, regulate your blood pressure. And so over time, while you are taking that medication, extreating more quote unquote excess fluid and releasing the magnesium, potassium, over time, your blood pressure is going to start going back up. And the doses of that hydrochlorothiazide, what, you're on 12.5 or 25 or whatever you're on, it's going to need to be increased or they're going to need to add on when not even need. I want I don't even want to use the word need because you don't let me stay on top topic. Um, they're going to add on a different medication. And this goes on and on and on. Cholesterol medications, uh, diabetes medications, high blood pressure, all these medications, they will rob your body of some nutrient. And they all have side effects. And so this is why you have to be aware of the benefits that you are expecting to get from this medication that you're taking. And so I was saying that back then as far as uh, understanding how these folks work when it comes to getting to the real solution, the real answer. Many of the times they give you metric victories, symbolic victories. They, 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 they obsess with metrics, which again is why I told you when they started doing all this talk about antibodies, like watch it, watch it. They're talking about antibodies for a reason because they have chemicals that can alter your physiology to produce a certain metric that they can now classify as a victory or a win. The same way they do with blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, cholesterol medications. But you have to ask yourself, does altering metrics or chemically altering the physiology of your body to get a certain uh, outcome, metric outcome, does that produce good health? Does that pr produce better outcomes? I did. A, I have a video on my YouTube channel and all my Facebook page called uh, Better Medication or Better Education. Everyone should really watch the video. I'm sorry about the sound quality in that video, but the content is very good. It teaches you how to ask higher quality questions. It makes you really think. And I'll go through and I'll show you um, this website called the NNT.com, number needed to treat.com. It would blow you away. Many of you are taking medications that you believe is going to grant you a certain outcome that the manufacturers themselves never said it would grant you. A lot of these manufacturers make it very clear that, no, we're just decreasing blood pressure. We didn't say anything about decreasing heart attack, strokes, or anything like that. No, we're just decreasing blood sugar. We didn't say anything about decreasing amputation, gangrene, blindness, kidney failure. Um, the people who are saying these other things as far as you need to take it because it's going to grant you all these great, marvelous, and wonderful benefits are the talking heads. And they can say that because they're not the manufacturers. And so uh, many of them are not going to be liable when it comes time for a lawsuit. All right. Let me finally get into uh, this conversation about this guy, your, your leader, America's doctor, uh, Fauci, and Rand Paul. So I want to pull up a video. So <clears throat> this is a video with uh, Rand Paul, Dr. Rand Paul, and little Anthony Keebler elf, Leprechaun Fauci. Um, and Fauci was actually supposed to be there in person. Hold on real quick, y'all. Yeah, Fauci was actually supposed to be at this hearing in person. But guess what? Guess what? He couldn't. Does anybody know why Fauci could not be to this hearing in person? Because the great Lord Fauci conveniently contracted the virus known as coronavirus. Yeah, that's right. Now, 
Did he really get coronavirus? Is he really positive? I don't know. Was he just afraid to face the wrath of Rand Paul face to face? I don't know. But that's neither here nor there. I mean, let's not put it past this guy to lie. I mean, he's shown that he will clearly lie about any and everything. That's This is what I'm talking about with these experts. These experts will lie about anything. They will say whatever they need to say. They will come to whatever conclusion you need them to come to. Just pay them on, pay them enough money. And so this video, this hearing is about uh, vaccine boosters for kids. I'm going to go ahead and start to play this. But as I play it, I will be stopping the video um, to talk about a couple of things. Uh, but overall, the video is like seven, eight, eight, nine minutes. So we won't be here too long. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Dr. Fauci, the government recommends uh, everybody take a booster over age five. Are you aware of any studies that show reduction in hospitalization or death for children who take a booster? All right. <clears throat> so very relevant question. They are making the recommendations for people over five, kids over five, uh, to take a booster. You would think that a recommendation to take something that is still rele relevantly still brand new and experimental because it's still new, it's still brand new because we don't have long-term studies. This is the long-term study right now we're doing or that they're doing. Not, I don't put my name on this. You would think that to make a recommendation, you have, especially talking about people's babies, you would think that you have a plethora of evidence to back up why you should inject your baby with a booster, all right? This is what you would think. So it's a very relevant and logical question. He's asking this question to probably the best guy, supposedly, that you can ask it to, Dr. Fauci. Who else should who who else would be better to ask this question than the guy who's been running around? Take the vaccine, all you know. We did. Who else would be better at asking this guy? Let's let's hear what this guy has to say. Uh, everybody take a booster over age five. Are you aware of any studies that show reduction in hospitalization or death for children who take a booster? Right now, there's not enough data that has been accumulated, Senator Paul, to indicate that that's the case. The I believe that the recommendation. All right. So the answer is no. The answer is no. So the way you should have started this whole thing off is by saying no, but they don't have any proof. There is no proof. There is no study, but they want your baby, your five-year-olds and above to take a booster with no evidence that it's protective, that it's needed, that it's going to be beneficial. Let me run that back. We're going to let this guy talk again. And I'm playing this and I'm doing this again. Another reason why I'm doing this is because I know that this is a video that a lot of people will not see. You won't see this. That has been accumulated, Senator Paul. Studies that show reduction in hospitalization or death for children who take a booster. Right now, there's not enough data that has been accumulated, Senator Paul, to indicate that that's the case. The I believe that the recommendation that was made was based on the assumption that if you look at the morbidity and mortality of children within each of the age groups, you know, zero so, to five, five to 11. Right. So, so, there, so two keywords that I picked up on from uh, the Skeebler Elf. He said, I believe, and then he also said assumption. Let's put up the definition real quick <laughs> for assumption. What is the definition of assumption? Real quick. It won't take long. Let's be very quick. Assumption. A thing that is accepted as true or as certain to happen without proof. Keyword, without proof. Without proof. Without proof. So you're asking these people. There, there are no studies in So you're, you're asking these people to do something with their kids or to give their kids something 
without any proof that it's going to be beneficial. We'll let them continue. Zero so, to five, five to 11. Right. So, so, let's, so there, there are no studies, and Americans should all know this, there are no studies on children showing a reduction in hospitalization or death with taking a booster. The only studies that were permitted, the only studies that were presented were antibody studies. So they say, if we give you a booster, you make antibodies. Now, a lot of scientists would question whether or not that's proof of efficacy of a vaccine. If I give you 10, or if I give a patient 10 mRNA vaccines and they make protein each time, or they make antibody each time, is that proof that we should give 10 boosters, Dr. Fauci? Uh, no, that, I think that is somewhat of an absurd exaggeration. No, it's not, Fauci, and you know it's not. You know it's not. Uh, what Dr. Rand Paul did was he just took it to its logical conclusion by him saying 10, because look, I mean, they're pushing five or whatever number they're on right now. I can't keep up. But how many are we going to do? How many are we going to do? And so he's taking it to his logical conclusion of saying 10, because it looks like one, you're heading in that way. Fauci is saying that's absurd. But based, but but what they're basing their assumptions on, and what they're basing their uh, their their ideas as far as why people should continue to take it, is based on antibodies. And what Dr. Rand Paul is saying is, yes, once again, you can give uh, a vaccine that will make the body produce antibodies. But how often are we going to do this? How much longer? We're, you know what's the perfect example? Um, once again, I bring it back to my home base, blood pressure medications and diabetes medications. You know how they kept on moving down the uh, the blood pressure requirement? 150 over 90, 140 over 80, 135 over 85, uh, 120 over, like how low are you going to go? Like why, why not? Let's just go no blood, no blood pressure. Well, that would be absurd, right? Well, what are you looking for? Because that's what Dr. Rand Paul is, is asking. Like, what is the what is the outcome that you're looking for? You're looking for a decrease in mortality, morbidity, right? As it pertains to this COVID, right? Same thing that they're looking for with, when it comes to blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. What outcome are you looking for? You're looking for a decrease in mortality, morbid morbidity. You're looking for a decrease in stroke and heart attacks and uh, kidney failure. These are the things that we're looking for. Okay, well... Someone should ask the question, what is the rate of death in that group? And we should also ask the question, same thing over in blood pressure. But also not only that, how does the therapeutic, the vaccine, the medication, how does that lower the chances or lower the risk of mortality and morbidity? Does it have any impact on mortality or morbidity? Because this is, once again, a higher quality question. Let's go back to blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. There's a, there's a study called ACCORD in advance in the VDAT study. These are all diabetic studies where essentially the conclusion, I'll, I'll spoil alert, what they found is that the medications, type 2, di type two diabetes medications, uh, don't work the way you think that they're going to work. No matter how aggressive you are with lowering your blood sugar with these medications, what they found is that these Aggressively lowering your, your blood pressure, I'm sorry, lowering your blood sugar with these medications actually increases the risk of cardiovascular events. Why? Because injecting insulin or taking medications that force your pancreas to increase insulin increases the chances of you having a cardiovascular event. Why? Because high insulin levels is extremely inflammatory, but it also causes the vessels to thicken and stiffen. And so, yeah, your blood sugar looks good. It looks low. I mean, your A1C is coming down, but people are dying from the very same things that you said you were saving, saving them from. And so the mortality and the morbidity, the overall outcome is not impacted in the way that you are telling people that it will be impacted. You're not getting the outcome that you said you're getting. You want it. However, people believe that they're doing something beneficial to themselves or for themselves because their blood sugar looks lower and their A1C looks lower. But that's not you doing that. That's the medications doing that. 
the only thing that has been shown to decrease mortality and morbidity as pertains to all of these chronic conditions is an improvement in lifestyle. Cut out the processed foods, cut out the processed drinks, move, exercise, fast, stop eating so frequently, these, get, get outside, vitamin D, be with the family, laugh, have fun, enjoy your life. These are the only things that have been shown to actually decrease mortality and morbidity. These medications don't work the way you think they work. Let's go back over this side with uh, the vaccines. Someone should ask the question, what is the survival rate? I, I've been asking this question since day one, and the answer really hasn't changed much at all. It's one of those things where it seems like a lot of them want to avoid this harsh reality. It's not harsh for us. It's great for us. It's great for society, but it seems to be very harsh for them. Because if you got to see that with this whole entire pandemic and COVID virus, vaccine, emergency use authorization, lockdowns, masks, six feet, isolations, 14 days stop the spread, mandates, losing your job, medical autonomy, gone, medical freedom, gone. If you got to look at all of that and then realize at the very top of all of that, there's a 99% survival chance. What? Yeah. With all of that being said, the chances of anyone in the population randomly of surviving COVID-19 infection is 99%. Now, of course, you have those groups that are going to be more vulnerable. And so when you start to segment the groups into age, but also into other health factors, comorbidities, their previous health, yes, you're going to see that there are actually vulnerable populations. And so the way things used to be done back in the old days and which was a logical way of doing things is that we protect the vulnerable populations. And so if anybody is going to get vaccinated or recommended to be vaccinated, but once again, they still have the choice, it's going to be the vulnerable populations, but they still have the choice. But to just randomly, or not randomly, to, to widely, broadly spread this mandate on any and everybody and then continue to recommend this booster at some point, at some point, you got to see the hustle. I know a lot of people don't want to talk about it. A lot of people don't want to, you know, acknowledge it because, you know, you feel like they got one on you. Yeah, they got one on a lot of us. They did. A lot of people were coerced. A lot of people were forced. A lot of people were threatened to get this shot or else they're going to lose their livelihood. I get it. I definitely sympathize with you. But at the end of the day, the people who should be getting their feet held to the fire, the people who are actually guilty in this whole entire thing, evil people, are going to run away. They're going to get away. They're going to get away. <laughs> Unless we choose to make it otherwise. So I'm actually talking about the end in the middle. So let me finish the middle. So the point of this guy, what he just said, is pretty much we don't have any proof. Um, and he was calling this guy, uh, his, his idea of 10 vaccines absurd, but they're, they're, they're working their way to 10 vaccines or boosters. They're working, they're marching their way there because when are they going to stop? What, and what outcome are you looking for? Because you have to ask this group, this five-year-old group, this five to 11 group, what is the case fatality rate in that group? It's almost non-existent. What are these people doing? Why Why are more Americans, more common everyday Americans not asking this question? Because this whole entire thing is going to pop back up. This whole conversation about vaccines and COVID is going to get heated again. It's going to get heated again. And so you shouldn't miss little videos and time frames like this where the guy who's making all of these rules and regulations and recommendations is getting slam dunked on right now by a senator. Well, he's a doctor also. But 
this guy you're gonna watch in this video, he's gonna do a horrible job of defending his stance and presenting his case. He's gonna do a horrible job, but you'll see. Well, Senator that Paul. is the proof that you use your committees. Uh, no, that, I think that is somewhat of an absurd exaggeration. Senator well, that Paul. is the proof that you use. Your committees use that. That's the only proof you have to tell children to take a booster is that they make antibodies. So it's not right. an there absurdity. Are, You're already no. at like five boosters for people. You've had, you know, two or three boosters. It's like, where is the proof? Now Mind you, Fauci was supposed to be there live, but he is isolating in his house because he is COVID positive. Remember, these folks have essentially been wrong the whole way through, but not wrong by, not wrong, uh, like accidentally wrong. They weren't wrong on accident. In my, in my opinion, they were wrong on purpose. They were wrong on purpose. Uh, remember they said, get the vaccine. When you, when you get it, you can't contract it and you won't spread it. And then it said, okay, you might contest positive, but you can't spread it. And then they said, okay, you can get it and you can spread it, but you won't be symptomatic. And then they said, you can get it, you can spread it, you'll be symptomatic, but your chances of being hospitalized won't be great. And so they kept on going back, 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 while never admitting that they were wrong. That's, you know, that's one thing these guys will not do. They will, not, ne they will never admit that they're wrong. They just keep backtracking, changing up. Look, squirrel. Ah, look, there it is. But never admit that they're wrong. But yeah, so this guy is in isolation right now. Fauci, who's had about, I don't know how many vaccines he's had. I'm sure whatever they offer, whatever they have available, he's had. Or maybe not. Or maybe not. Maybe he's, maybe he's at zero. I don't know. I mean, you can't trust these folks. But they say he had all his vaccines and all the boosters. Um, but nonetheless, this 81-year-old guy is uh, COVID positive. He's up to date with his shots. And um, they're over here still pushing this, this recommendation. And trust me, like I said, they're going to get back to the talk about mandates. It's not an absurdity. You're already at like five boosters for people. You've had, you know, two or three boosters. It's like, where is the proof? Now, I think there is yeah. probably some indication for older folks that have some risk factors. For younger folks, there's not. But here's the other yeah. thing. There are some risk factors for, for the vaccine. So the risk of myocarditis with a second dose for adolescent boys, 12 to 24, is about 80 in a million. This is both from the CDC and from the Israeli study. It's also in the VAERS study, remarkably similar, four boys, much higher from boys than girls and much higher than the background. The background's about two. Okay, <clears throat> so this is very important. He said out of a million boys, 80 are going to have heart issues, myocarditis, pericarditis, heart issues. Now, some people might be saying, ah, 80 out of a million? That's not much. Well, let me ask you a question. Out of that million, how many are actually going to die from COVID? What's the answer to that? You can't have it both ways. You can't say 80 is not much, and then out of a million, when that number comes out, and say, oh, my goodness, one is too many. If we can save one life, but well, what about one heart? But not only that, they say that the uh, the background, so pretty much when you vaccinate a million boys, they saw that 80 are going to have heart issues. But if you don't taking the vaccine out just out of a million boys you're looking at two having heart issues that's a 40 that's a 40 that's a 40x increase 40x increase in heart issues now as a parent or as an aunt uncle grandparent you giving your child over to get this vaccine knowing that there's a 40x chance that they might be one of the 80, how comfortable do you feel when you look at kids who, in general, who are not vaccinated or just infected with the virus and do fine with it? Because that's a route as well, just not getting vaccinated. And them being 75% of the country, so they say, have already had COVID-19. 
So there's a very good chance a lot of kids have already had it, got over it, and now they're pushing again to recommend that more kids get it. But the question is, what is the mortality rate? What is what is the hospitalization rate? Like what are what benefits are these kids going to actually get from it? Especially in that young age group where essentially no one, no, none of those kids are at risk of being hospitalized or dying from this virus. I mean, extremely, extremely low. And then unfortunately, the ones that do have issues, and unfortunately, the ones that do get hospitalized and unfortunately die are kids who already have comor comor comorbidities. They already have is other issues going on. But when we're looking at just the general healthy over five uh, population, they're relatively largely unimpacted by this virus. What they're doing is they're treating everyone like the 70 plus population with comorbidities. Like they're, they're treating everyone like they're 70 and older with comorbidities. That's what they're doing. Now, is that good science? Is it good medicine? I don't think so. Is it good money? Some would say that this is good money because you pretty much made everybody your customer. Let's continue. Per million. So there is risk and there are risks. And you're telling everybody in America just blindly go out there because we made antibodies. So it is not an absurd corollary to say if you have 10. In fact, you probably make antibodies if you get 100 boosters. All right? That's not science. That's conjecture. And we should not be making public policy on it. So, Senator Paul, if I might respond to that. For, everybody needs to understand that what Rand Paul is doing to Fauci is he is slam dunking over him, crotch all in his face. Fauci's looking up, and he had nothing but crotch just in his face, and he's defenseless. He, he's doing a horrible job. Fauci's doing a horrible job of lying to us right now. I mean, he could do better as far as trying to lie and come up with a better case, but he's just he's just doing he's failing right now. This is horrible. That uh, we just heard in his opening King public policy on it. Now, mind you, all of this is about kids, kids over five. That's what we're talking about. I want you to keep this in mind when this Keebler elf starts talking. So, Senator Paul, if I might respond to that, uh, we just heard in his opening statement, uh, ranking member Burr talk about his staff who went to Israel. And if you look at the data from Israel, the boosts, both the third shot boost and the fourth shot boost, was associated with a clear-cut clinical effect, mostly in elderly people, but also as they gathered more data, even in people in the 40s and the 50s. Why are you telling me about elderly people? Why are you telling me about 40s and 50s? We're talking about kids, ages five and up. Like, why are you using something that's irrelevant to the population we're talking about? Why are you showing, my man already said that, yeah, the older population, 65 70 and up could benefit from it why and that's i just told you all he's they're treating everybody as if they are 70 plus with comorbidities and making that law for everybody why are you telling us why are you bringing this up right now because he's trying to find a way out of the corner because <laughs> Rand paul is just laying it on him right now so he's trying to find a way to get out this corner so he can still try to save face but he's just doing a horrible job but this is this is your this is your leader. This is America's doctor. So there is clinical data, but, but not in children. Well, uh, gosh, yo, <laughs> y'all see Rand Paul face? Yo, he looks like an upset mother who who just who just had enough and caught him red-handed. Look at Rand, Look at this guy's face. Look at this guy's face. He he's pissed off. He's fed up. Had enough. But he's in the fifties. So there is clinical data. But, but not in children. Woo! Well, uh, well see, again, here's the thing is, you're not willing to be honest with the American people. So, for example, 75% of kids have had the disease. 75%. 75%. I don't know where the current death number is right now. I can get it. Last time I checked, it was in the 400s. Um, I'm not sure where it's at right now. But we're talking about 75% of kids 
already contracting the virus and getting over it. 75%. That's a lot of kids. And now you want to make this hard push, this recommendation, this quote unquote recommendation, you know, it's going to end up being uh, something that you can't get into school without. Um, you know, they're playing the long game. You're making this recommendation to take this vaccine that is relatively brand new, where we don't have studies on long term effects. And you're going to essentially eventually make it law. With no proof that it's beneficial. Especially for people who've already had the virus. They've already had the virus. They already beat the virus. Kids have been once again doing relatively well, extremely well, as pertains to this virus. And the variants have been getting weaker and weaker and weaker the way, once again, that we said these things usually work. From the alpha to the delta to the uh, Omicron. That's how these things usually work. Why is the CDC not including this in the data? You can ask the question. You can do laboratory tests to find out who's had it and who hasn't had the disease. What is the incidence of hospitalization and death for children who've been infected with COVID subsequently going to the hospital or dying? What, what, is, what is the possibility if your kid has had COVID, which is 75% of the country's had COVID, what is the chance that my child's going to the hospital or dying? So this is probably the most important question that he's asking, that he's presenting, and that we all as parents should be asking, what are the chances of my, my child getting sick with COVID, going to the hospital and dying? You should know that. That's called being informed. And there used to be a time in medicine where you, used to have to, you would have to be given the information and sign informed consent stating that you understand the pros and the cons and the benefits and X, Y, Z. Um, it's called informed consent. And so how can you as a parent make an informed decision if you don't have all the information because trust me you don't have all the information this guy fauci is going to show you that he's not giving you the information uh listen to his answer when he gives it but that is a very relevant question what is the what are the chances that my child contracts or gets covid uh gets hospitalized and dies from this virus and if anybody should know that answer, it should be the guy that's making the recommendation that your child get another shot. Once again, if you're making the recommendation, I expect that you have some evidence to back up your recommendation for this brand new vaccine. Let's hear what he has to say the possibility if your kid has had COVID, which is 75% of the country's had COVID, what is the chance that my child's going to the hospital or dying? If you look at the number of deaths in pediatrics, Senator, you can see that there are more deaths of people who have had it, of people who have had the disease. Uh, Senator, we also know from other studies that the optimal degree of protection when you get infection is to get vaccinated after infection. And in fact, showing reinfection in the era of Omicron and the sublineages, that vaccination- But you can't follows. answer the question I asked. The question I ask is how many kids are dying and how many kids are going to the hospital who've already had COVID? The answer may be zero, but you're not even giving us the data because you have so much wanted to protect everybody from all the data because we're not smart enough to look at the data when you release data earlier when the cdc released the data they left out the category of 18 to 49 on whether or not there was a health benefit for for adults 18 to 49 why was it left out when critics finally complained it was finally included because there was no health benefit from taking a booster between on, the 18 man. to 49 and the cdc study another question come on come on i hope y'all caught all that they're withholding information that wouldn't be beneficial to their overall profits, essentially is what it comes down to. Because if, once again, if you're making the segment of 18 to 40 year olds take a freaking vaccine, mandating it, or they can't go to work, X, Y, Z, tell them that it's beneficial and that it's gonna stop, save them. And remember your boy, Joe Biden, fucking, I'm sorry, wandering up on stage and saying that we are in a pandemic of the unvaccinated and then oops, now it looks like everybody can get it. Everybody can spread it. And all of these things, these folks have been wrong essentially on purpose every single step of the way.
So what he's talking, Rand, I mean, uh, Fauci, he brings in this line about we know that people who get vaccinated post-natural infection do better. This guy should really stop talking. Remember in the beginning, and this is something I made a video on, about several videos on, when he, he was going around, not only him by himself, but he essentially started this whole thing off, going around saying that the vaccine protects you better than natural immunity. He was going around saying the vaccine will pro provide robust immunity and protection against death and hospitalizations. And we're like, yo, how, how do you how do you know that? We just went the whole 2020 without the vaccine and we got a 99% survival rate. And now you guys just rolled out this brand new vaccine. And all of a sudden you did the study showing that the vaccine is stronger than natural immunity. That would be the first time ever. That would be the first time ever because the vaccine actually needs your natural immunity in that order to create a response. Uh, but this will be the first time ever that you got a vaccine that actually provides a, a better protection against this virus after natural exposure. And so once they came out and said, because pretty much now everybody admits that that was wrong. Natural immunity protects better than the vaccine, which always made sense. It always made sense. You have to keep notes on these folks because they lie, they get exposed, but they never go back and apologize. And it never makes mainstream media. Like it never becomes a big deal. It never becomes a big deal. It just gets swept under the rug because they need for you all to not know that they they lied to you. They need for you all not to know that, yeah, we just try to secure the bag. And so if they don't make a big deal out of it. They just move on to the next lie, into the next lie, into the next lie. And the next thing you know, you're trying to figure out what happened to my health and my family's health. And why do we have all these strange symptoms that we don't seem to know what to do about anything about? So I think it's still relevant that we uh, make sure we think about or ask the question of um, what is the overall survival rate? What's the overall case fatality of this virus, this pandemic? Um, like I said in the very beginning, with the strongest variant, alpha variant, you had a 99% survival rate. On the low end, 98%. And over time, as always with viruses, the variants get weaker. And so the Delta was weaker. Omicron was weaker. And the way things work, unless somebody is doing some weird shit in the lab, the way things naturally work is the variants get weaker and weaker and weaker, naturally. And so you're telling me that let's take this population of 5 to 18, or 18 to 40, healthy, their chances of survival was already 99%. Many of them have already been in, contracted the virus. Contracted. Contracted sounds wrong. Many of them have already been exposed to the virus, already been positive with the virus. And now you're making this push for more boosters so that you can make that survival rate what? It's already at 99%. You're trying to make it a 99.999999% survival rate. This is what the lockdowns were about. This is what the mandates were about. Is that what you're trying to do? You're trying to tell me that this was your pandemic. Just think about it. The survival rate for healthy individuals, 5 up to 18, up to 40 rate, 40 years old. Really, everyone in general, overall 99% survival rate. And that's extremely high, especially if we're talking about something that's supposed to be a pandemic. Especially if we're talking about something that requires emergency use authorization of an experimental vaccine. Like, this is a very high survival rate for something where you're pulling out all tools, like all hands are on deck for a survival rate of 99%. I don't know, it doesn't match up, doesn't make sense to me. Um, and that's why you know, I left a lot of those things alone because it got to the point where I'm like, all right, I get it, I get it. 
let's continue on. Let's finish out the video. For you, the NIH continues to refuse to voluntarily divulge the names of Hold scientists who complained it was finally included because there was no health benefit from taking a booster between the 18 to 49 and the CDC study. Another question for you. The NIH continues to refuse to voluntarily divulge the names of scientists who receive royalties and from which companies. Over the period of time from 2010 to 2016, 27,000 royalty payments were paid to 1,800 NIH employees. We know that not because you told us, but because we forced you to tell us through the Freedom of Information Act. Over $193 million was given to these 18 employee, 1,800 employees. Can you tell me that you have not received a royalty from any entity that you ever oversaw the distribution of money in research grants? So very straightforward question. Um, he just wants to know if, yo, did they lace your pockets? You know, just getting kickback. Um, now, I will tell you, as pertains to money, I've looked at this whole entire thing enough to say that money, fraud, that part is most likely happening for sure. But it's the low hanging fruit. Like the money scheme is the low hanging fruit. I believe that the money part is one of those things where it's like, oh, no, you caught us. You caught us, you know, getting paid off. We made 100 million. We made 200 million. We, we made a billion. Oh, no, you got us. Oops, I guess I better go do my five years or I better go do my whatever. And that is the win that they would like to give you. Yeah, greedy. We're just greedy. We just took the money. You got us. While there's actually something else like that, that, that win, that victory, that whatever you want to call it is a facade. It's happening. But I don't think that's the crux of the issue. I don't think that's the crux of uh, what's really pushing this whole entire thing. It's not It's not just money. These folks, I believe, they are getting paid off for sure. We ain't doing it for free. All this lying. Like, once again, I told you, these experts are whores. Like, they will sell their expertise for the right price tag. So, yeah, that's happening. But as far as that being the actual driving factor, nah, it's too simple, too straightforward. So Rand Paul asked this guy, yo, did they lace you? Did you get paid? Very straightforward question. And it's also a question that should be answered. It should be a yes or no, yes or no uh, answer. If you're asking me if the American Diabetic Association is paying me to X, Y, Z, no, no. Like, nah, like, no. Are you kidding me? Um, but that's a question that I can answer or not answer. I feel like I would have the right to answer or not answer that. But for this guy right here who's making all of these recommendations and policies and being the, the, the head of recommending mandates, ruining people's lives and their livelihoods and the way they make money and uh, causing this rift in, in the country and all of the, the issues that we have because of you know mask versus no mask and he was in charge of this whole entire thing where he initially came on and said, no mask, mask don't work. You know, there's no need to wear mask and it's just, it's facial decoration. And then he comes out and said, well, no, yes, you need mask. It'll save lives. And then he backtracks again and said, we were just saying it because we didn't want everyone to run to the stores to get the mask. And then the doctors didn't have the mask. And then he came back and said, yes, mask, you need wrath because you need a good fitting one. We met you need an N95. And so he's been lying the whole entire way, right? Lying the whole entire way. And so you got the guy who's been lying the whole entire way, who's been causing a lot of the chaos that we're seeing, you know, uh, vaccines are going to stop the spread. It's going to stop you from getting it. Lies, 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 over and over and over and over and over. It's been him. So for the guy who's been causing, raising hell and causing mass chaos for the past two years, you're asking him a simple question. Are you getting paid by these folks? Are you getting paid? I think that's a logical question. The guy who's the doctor, America's doctor, who's leading the, the charge for this whole entire pandemic response. We just got one question for you, bro. You couldn't answer the other questions. We asked you if there's any uh, proof that it's going to uh, benefit the kids. We asked you if there's any proof that um, the kids are going to die at a high rate or any rate, really. And you're just not answering or you're lying. Now we're asking you, if you're getting paid by these folks, are you getting paid by these folks?
Let's see what Fauci says. Oversaw the distribution of money in research grants. Um, well, first of all, let's. Did he say, um? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I got three kids, right? And also, long time ago, back in back in my days, you know, I've been busted on some stuff. And you know, when you get busted, and it's a surprise bust, you need a little buffer of time to think. I called my daughter out on this the other day. She did a buffer response. <laughs> Fauci just gave you a buffer. Um, <laughs> the whole entire time, Fauci did not say um at all. Fauci, I haven't, I don't even really hear Fauci do the um, <laughs> but you asked him about money. And Rand Paul asked a very long question. That question was like five minutes long. <laughs> and your boy still needed time to respond. <laughs> yeah. Yo, watch Fauci, Fauci's face. ...of money in research grants. Um, well, first of all, let's talk about royalty. That's the question. No, that's the question. <laughs> um, well, first of all, let's talk about the history of money. Okay, anybody ever thought about the history of money? Let's talk about that. If we're going to talk about getting money, you're going to accuse me of getting money. Let's talk about the history of money. Yo, this guy's full of it. This guy's full of it. If you want to accuse me of doing something as heinous of uh, as taking money while being the leader of this whole pandemic response, my answer is hell no, I'm not taking money. Like, no, like at least lie to us aggressively, Fauci. Um, let's first talk about come on, bro. Get out of here. Um, well, first of all, let's talk about royalty. That's the question. No, that's the question. Have you ever know. overseen have you ever received a royalty plan. payment? from a company that you later oversaw money going to that company? You know, I don't know as a fact, but I doubt it. Well, I well here's the thing is, why don't you... <laughs> Yo, Fauci. <laughs> Yo, this evil. Pure evil. Pure evil. These are bad people. Very bad people. These are very... These are bad people. These experts. <laughs> They will lie about any and everything. They will come up to a scientific conclusion about any and everything. It doesn't matter what it is. If the bag is big enough, they'll find a way to come up with a study or do a study that gives you that very outcome that you need. And that's what you got going on right now. One of the things. Once again, I believe that's some low-hanging fruit. Go ahead, Fauci. But you let us know. Why don't you reveal you. how much you've gotten and from what entities? The NIH okay, refuses. Set, set Look, we ask them. We ask them. The NIH, we ask them whether or not who got it and how much. They refuse right. to tell us. They sent it redacted. Here's what I want to know. It's not just about you. Everybody on the vaccine committee, have any of them ever received money from the people who make vaccines? Right. Can you tell me uh, that? Why don't we know that? Why don't we know that? The vaccine committee. Why don't we know if they've received money from these folks? And why can't he get the answer? Why, why, why don't we know that? Once again, I think this is a low hanging fruit. I think this is something to uh, to grab attention and for us to really focus on and to really try to go down that path um, so that they can be like, all right, you got us. But there's something else going on behind that or something else going on of greater concern. But uh yeah, that's a pretty good question, and we don't have the answer to it. Can you tell me if anybody Senator, on the vaccine approval committees ever received gonna, any money from people who make the vaccines? Question, sound bite number one. Are you going to let me answer a question? Okay, so let me give you some information. First of all, according to the regulations, people who receive royalties are not required to divulge them, even on their financial statement, according to the Buy Dole Act. Which is so crazy. let me give you some example. From 2015 to 2020, oh I the only royalties I have was my lab and I made a monoclonal antibody for use in vitro reagent that had nothing to do with patients. 
And during that period of time, my royalties range from $21 a year to $700 a year. And the average per year was $191.46. It's all, reda it's all redacted, and you can't get any information on the 1,800 Senator Paul, scientists. Your, your time I'm, is I'm We want to know Senator whether Senator or not Paul. people got money from the people who made the manufacturing Senator Paul, vaccine. your time is long over expired. I gave you an additional two and a half minutes. The witness has responded. We are going to move on. Senator Sanders. All right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that was it. I recommend you all go check that video out on YouTube. Uh, I think it's on C-SPAN. Um, and I, I recommend that you keep an eye out, keep an ear out, make sure you're informed about these things that are coming. Because once again, I know you may be done with COVID, but COVID's not done with you. I mean, like the virus may be done with you, but your corrupt government is not done with you. Oops. They're not done with you. So It'll benefit you to stay informed because once again, you know, they are going to make this push <clears throat> to have it forced on your kids. And um, they are going to put tight restrictions and rules and regulations around that to make it almost impossible for it not to, you know, for you not to be involved in that. And you are not going to have the informed consent that you should have. Um, you're not going to have the data that you should have as far as the risk of Hospital, hospitalization and death, uh, which is something that we all should have, but for whatever reason, well, you know, um, we're not being given that. And so think about all that, but also think about what I've been saying since February 2020. All right. Um, does the response match the reality of this whole entire thing that we've seen? Think about it. All right. I'm going to hop off. Um, I'm curious to know what you all think. Whether you agree with me or you you don't agree or, you know, I'm just curious to see what, what you all think. All right. So um, don't worry. I'll get back to the diabetes and blood pressure talk. Uh, but this one I had to address. So I'll let y'all later. All right. Peace.